good to be back again this morning. Uh, let's get back in the Word. And the book of Acts. It's uh, Luke's historical account of the early church and uh, the early Christians and why the gospel spread and how it spread. And uh, this morning's passage is going to be along that wavelength. Now we're going to be in Acts uh, 11. 19 to 30 uh, this morning, and speaking of Christians, we're going to find out how the term Christian came about, so we got uh, a little bit of a history lesson here this morning, too, but um, anyway, if you got your Bibles, turn there, Acts 11, uh, 19 to 30. <laughs> And it says, Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word, no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a large number of people were added to the Lord. And then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. And each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. And they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. All right, let's uh, pray here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time. Uh, we could be here in your house this morning and be in your sanctuary uh, this morning, Lord, and I just thank you that we have the health and the freedom to be here. And uh, we do want to lift up all the folks on our prayer request lists, and, uh, all those that are sick and battling diseases, and uh, Kenneth and Nancy this morning too, and uh, all the folks that have lost uh, loved ones, and uh, the uh, man who uh, got the lung transplant, we pray for him. That, uh, he would go on, and uh, all the ones we forgot, Lord, you know who they are, and we just pray for all of them. I pray you send your Holy Spirit upon us this morning, Lord, uh, to fill up our hearts in those uh, empty places where we need it, so that we can learn from your word and live it out. And in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, as we saw there, this passage pretty much records the final step of... Uh, of the Gospels uh, beginning to be proclaimed to Gentiles, okay, specifically the formation of a Gentile church of the city of Antioch in Syria. And apparently so many people came to Christ in Antioch that uh, the, the local townspeople there coined a new phrase, okay, for, the, uh, for Christ's followers or a new name for Christ's followers. It says in verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And that nickname probably came from the Gentile townspeople uh, because believers would have been reluctant to describe themselves, uh, you know, with a term built on Christ's holy name. They, they may have not wanted to do that. Besides, they already had uh several long used self designations such as you know the disciples the saints they call themselves the believers the brethren uh, if you remember the followers of the way uh, that one's been kind of popular here in the book of acts 
And moreover, the Jews would have never named them Christians because Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. So to call them Christians, followers of the Messiah, would have been unthinkable. So the people of Antioch there, they observed this, you know, vibrant spiritual movement. Okay, it was hard to miss, even though to them it, it probably appeared uh, narrow-minded and suspicious. So seeking a new term to describe it, they took the Greek name for Messiah, and then they added a Latin suffix, and it produced a hybrid word we pronounce today in English as Christian. Okay, so that in a nutshell is how we Christians got our title, right? That's where it started. Uh, there in that passage in Antioch. So you fast forward to today, you know, we, we live in a time when the term Christian has become one of the most vague terms in the English language. Uh, you know, you go back during the British colonial era, it, it almost just became synonymous with the term Englishman. And, you know, it really didn't make, make any difference how godly or ungodly the man was. If he was, you know, white and had a British accent, well, then he was just Christian. Or in our own times, you know, Christian nations... You know, we've engaged in two world wars, uh, you know, for example. Some people think that everyone who's not a Jew or a Muslim is a Christian. Some people in the world think that everyone in America is a Christian, right? They'd say, well, that's America over there. They're all Christians. One time, uh, Dr. Harry Ironson, he handed a gospel booklet to a man on a train and you know, the man turned to him and asked, well, what'd you give me that book for? Well, Dr. Ironside replied, I thought you might be interested in my ask, are you a Christian? Well, he replied indignantly, take a good look at me. Do I look like a Jew or a Chinaman? And he said, well, you look like an American. Well, then he responded, that is your answer, right? Even today, many people are willing to say, I am a Christian, but would balk at saying, you know, they're, they're believers, they don't want to say that, or disciples, or, you know, they don't want to say I'm a follower of Christ. So, you know, the, the name just kind of has a generic ring to it a lot of times. And there are, you know, cultural Christians who've not experienced saving commitment to Jesus Christ, you know, so it's important that we remember what the term means, that, you know, not subscribe to the big, vague uh, you know, way people use it around the world. Now, back into our passage in Antioch here, you know, Antioch was situated on the uh, Orontes River. It was about three mi 300 miles north of Jerusalem and 20 miles east of the Mediterranean. And during the first century, Antioch was actually the third largest city in the world behind Rome and Alexandria. So it was a kind of a melting pot, you know, for at least five different cultures. Uh, there were Greeks there, Romans, uh, Jews, Arabs, and Persians. And the Jews, they made up one-seventh of the city's population. And, you know, they actually had a legal sanction to follow their own laws in their own neighborhoods. Okay, and then Antioch, it was also quite famous for its chariot racing uh, for its deliberate pursuit of pleasure. So if you want to think back to the first century and what Antioch was like, you could kind of think of it as, you know, like a Las Vegas of the first century. Okay, that was Antioch for you. And Antioch was most famous for its worship of uh, Daphne, whose temple stood five miles outside of town in, in kind of a laurel grove and uh, you know, Apollo's famous pursuit of, of Daphne there, where it was reenacted day and night by, you know, men in the city and the priestesses who were, you know, in fact, just kind of ritual prostitutes. So that's kind of a backdrop uh, of the city. You know, all of that was just going on. So amazingly, all that considered, it was in this city with all its, you know, sin and immorality, kind of a sin city of its own day, that it says the disciples were first called Christians. 
Okay, so looking at the days we live in and the place we live in, I mean, you know, this is just a, a good reminder, okay, that God's light can shine in even the darkest places, and it's easy to get discouraged about the, you know, society we live in, and, you know, it just kind of seems to be going downhill in a lot of areas. Well, you know, this is just a good reminder that God's light can shine even in the darkest places, okay? If the gospel can spread in Antioch, it can spread anywhere. So that's your backdrop on what was going on in Antioch, which brings us to our question of the day, which is, well, why were the believers first called Christians in Antioch? You know, what was it about them that made the other people all around them give them this new nickname? Right? Obviously, they weren't going unnoticed. So that brings us to our first point this morning, which is, well, first of all, they had good preaching. They earned that nickname there first, because they, first of all, because they had good preaching. It says in verses 19 to 20, now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, uh, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. So persecution, see, it kind of thrust two different kinds of believers out into other parts of the world. You remember Stephen, when he got killed, everybody got scared, and they all, you know, moved off. Now, the first kind shared the good news with only fellow Jews. Now, the second was willing to share the gospel with both Jews and Gentiles because they were, you know, Greek-speaking Jews and weren't so attached to Jewish prejudices. Remember how we talked about Peter last week and God's like, you gotta, you're gonna have to get rid of these prejudices and start talking to everybody with the gospel here. Okay, so merely just kind of verbalizing the indwelling witness of Christ in their hearts, they weren't even aware that they were doing anything, you know, radical. To them, it was just good conversation, right? I know this Christ, and, you know, here's what it means to me. And these unnamed Jews from the island of uh, Cyprus and uh, Cyrene, which is, you know, really kind of North Africa. You remember Simon of Cyrene, the black dude who helped Jesus carry his cross there from North Africa. And with no official direction, no human instruction, no precedent to follow, you know, nothing but a burning love for Christ. They, they took the message to Antioch without, you know, realizing the revolutionary greatness of their act. Okay, they, they were the first believers to, to bring that explosive light of Christianity into the, you know, midnight darkness of paganism. And Antioch, you know, was, was, was not evangelized by, you know, apostles or, you know, the best of the best or, you know, the Billy Grahams of the day, but it was, you know, evangelized by average members of the church who were just straight out willing to share their faith. Okay, so wherever these fugitives landed, they started a fire, right? They took, they took the gospel message with them. Okay, sharing Christ was to them as, you know, natural as breathing or blinking. It was just something they did. Everyday believers, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, you know, just blew away the hold of paganism on the people who needed to hear it the most. Right? What an example that is. And the result was a great harvest in Antioch. Verse 21 says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Okay, so notice that there was no, you know, formal structure here. You know, they didn't have a, you know, a service order or, you know, have a annual guide come out or, you know, it was just the Lord's hand. And a tremendous number of new believers so a heavenly flame now burned in the midst of the spiritual darkness of Antioch and, and, you know, 
this was so foreign to its bleak environment that it was going to uh, alter the vocabulary of the city and indeed the entire world. And a similar thing happened to uh, George Fox and his followers in 1640 when he stood before uh, a certain Justice Bennett and, and he bid him to tremble at the word of the Lord. He warned him, he's like, you better tremble at the word of the Lord. And in response, the Justice called Fox and his followers Quakers. Right? You ever wonder why Quakers were called Quakers? It's because they warned people, you better tremble at the word of God. Right? So they were quaking. The same thing happened to the Methodists who were so named because of their systematic, methodical pursuit of, of holiness. So they were, you know, methodical about, you know, trying to be righteous. That's how they got called Methodists. So we know how the early Christians got their name and the Quakers got their name and the Methodists got their name. So if somebody had to give us a nickname, you know, what would it be? If somebody had to give you a nickname about your faith, what would it be? You know, what words do they use now? You know, when God's people live for Christ in such depth and power that those around them have to strive for a new term to describe what they see, you know, that's awesome. Good or bad. Nowadays, we're going to get bad nicknames. But that's a good thing. Right? That means you're making a difference. Right? Somebody calls you a Bible thumper. Take that as a compliment. So back to our passage here. Before long, the Jerusalem church heard what was going on in Antioch. And they, uh, well, they decided to send good old Barnabas to check things out. And that brings us to our second point today, which is uh, good evidence. <coughs> Number one was good preaching. Two is uh, good evidence. So Barnabas, you remember Barnabas, right? Son of encouragement. He was actually uh, raised on the island of Cyprus. He was a, a Hellenistic Jew, Greek-speaking Jew. And he, and he probably had personal friends among some of those evangelizing in Antioch because some of them were from Cyprus too, right? So Barnabas, he was, you know, a, a proven encourager and reconciler and you know he was the one who brought Saul and the Jerusalem church together if you remember that when uh, Paul had his his uh, Damascus Road experience there and he was cheerful he was big hearted and he was loving and you know he was the perfect choice to go uh, and check it out to send and go check it out verse 23 says when he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. And notice there that Barnabas, he saw the evidence of the grace of God, right? It says he saw the grace of God. He saw it. And he could have easily seen the situation in a different light. You know, these people were new, untaught Christians. Which means they still carry the dirt and the bad habits of Antioch with them. You know, some of them had miles to go in their language and relationships and ethics and, you know, practices. But Barnabas saw the evidence of the grace of God. Okay, you could see Christian grace and charm in their lives. You could see the fruits of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace so on and it says he was glad so he simply encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts okay that means to, to meditate on him to, to make him everything we'd say you know keep him first place in your life and so on so in this way Barnabas helped them focus on the things that would cleanse them of the defilement of you know, Antioch. When you're in an environment like that, it's real easy for the gravity of the, you know, nasty to just pull you back in. So help them break those old habits. 
And his advice is appropriate for all, you know, Christians, whether in the beginning stages or well along the path. You know, somebody once warned that many of us are so busy thinking about Christianity that we've lost our hold of Christ. Right? Kind of can't see the forest for the trees. So anyway, Barnabas, he saw grace, he rejoiced, he tenderly encouraged God's people. And how was he able to do this? You know, you just gotta love Barnabas every time he shows up in the Bible. How was he able to do that? Well, verse 24 tells us, it says, he was a good man, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. Okay, so that refreshing water of the Spirit flowed from you know, Barnabas' innermost being. His faith produced spiritual desire, expectation, and dependence. So can you think of anybody that's as encouraging as, you know, he was? Somebody in your life, you know? I think we've all met Christians like that somewhere along the way. So why not be a Barnabas yourself? So the church there was a holy but complicated presence in the dark city of Antioch. And, you know, the, the church became even more vital and to the pagan mind more perplexing as the goodness and fullness of the Holy Spirit and faith seen in Barnabas began to, you know, just reproduce in that young church. And like the end of verse 24 says, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Large numbers of people were added to the Lord. So the ministry in Antioch was going so well that it was too much for Barnabas. He was a fine man, but he, he had his limitations. So maybe Barnabas laid awake one night and he was burdened and tired and exploring his options. You know, he was kind of overwhelmed by all this and he needed some help, right? It was growing by leaps and bounds. and you know, But that was a good problem to have. And then he thought about Paul and he immediately began praying for God's guidance. And that uh, brings us to our third point this morning, which is good recruitment. Now, when Barnabas and Paul had seen each other the last time, it was eight to ten years earlier. And you remember the, uh, the, the church in Jerusalem sent Paul to Tarsus for, for safety? You remember that? You might remember that from back in chapter 9. And it was there he remained. So a lot of water had gone under the bridge since Paul's conversion. And, you know, he was now a well-seasoned servant of Christ. Right? He'd had enough time to get there. And we're not exactly sure of everything that happened in Paul's life during those, those years, eight to ten years, but certainly Paul continued preaching during that time. You know, perhaps this is when he received the, the five sets of 39 stripes at the hands of synagogue officials and, you know, underwent other persecutions like he mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11. Go back and read that. This might have been in, in that time that that happened. It may have been uh, the time when he experienced the loss of all things, as he describes in uh, Philippians 3.8, maybe disowned by his family. This might have been the time when he had the ecstatic experience of being caught up to the third heaven, like he describes in 2 Corinthians 12. You know, maybe that happened during those years. But needless to say, by this point, Paul was no longer a newbie. Right? His theology had crystallized and matured. He'd had time to live it out for a while. He was full of Christ. It's like he said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we've seen Barnabas' good, goodness expressed in his generosity to the church in uh, you know, chapter 4, 
and then is sticking his neck out to vouch for Paul to the apostles in, in chapter 9. But here we even find something maybe even better because Barnabas would soon yield his ministry to Paul. Now Barnabas was older, more respected, and in many ways more uh, experienced, but when he asked Paul to help in Antioch, you know, and when they later took a missionary journey together, Paul began to, to play a greater role than Barnabas did. So the story began as, you know, Barnabas and Saul, but it soon became, you know, Paul and Barnabas. And it stayed that way to the end. Barnabas to Paul was like John the Baptist to Christ when he said he must become greater and I must become less. So when Paul traveled with uh, you know, Barnabas to heathen Antioch, you know, they were quite a dynamic duo. They complemented one another beautifully thanks to the, you know, orchestration of the Spirit of God. Barnabas, he was, you know, sensitive, empathetic, gracious, encouraging. And then Paul, he kind of had this brilliantly honed, razor sharp you know, intellect, kind of almost like a lawyer, you know? It's kind of like God pairs them up and they're almost kind of like good cop, bad cop, you know? They worked well together. And together with the Spirit's power working through them, they were, you know, pretty much unconquerable. So to wrap it up here this morning, you know, we kind of had a little history lesson here this morning on how you got your name as a Christian. <coughs> Right? The first century sin city of Antioch could not fit this new people into any of its categories. So they had to come up with a new name for them. So a new name was born. And I'm sure there was a mocking tone to the nickname. Perhaps even a bit of rage. Yeah, because these, these, these people were such a contradiction to the spirit of Antioch. Right? Swimming against the current. You know, they probably didn't say, oh, there goes the Christians. They said, hey, there goes the Christians. Right? But oh well. So that new term, it was kind of a mongrel name, part Greek and part Latin. You know, but it said it all. Christians. Followers of Christ. Right? And Christ was so much on these believers' lips. They, they lived so like Christ, that no other name would do, really. Okay, Christian is a wonderful name, and it's a name of which we should seek to be worthy. So as we look at this passage here this morning, you know, go home and maybe think about that. This is where the title was born, the, the word Christian. You call yourself a Christian, right? So think about what it means. What does it mean to you? And what are you going to do about it? Right? All right, let's close in a uh, word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again for this time we could be here this morning and uh, that we could come across a passage uh, like this where Christians uh, first got their nickname and that's what we all profess to be, and I just pray that we'd uh, go out of here this morning thinking about what that means to us, to be followers of Christ, and what we should be doing about it, and what would people call us if they have to call us something. And, and Lord, I just pray that that's what we would get out of this, that this would make us better followers of Christ. We just want to pray for all the folks, too, once again, on our prayer request list, and all those sick and in and out of the hospital, those with diseases, those that have uh, things at the hospital coming up, that you be with all of them. All the folks that have lost uh, loved ones here in uh, recent times too. And uh, we just thank you for all that you do. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die for us. And we thank you that you just had such uh, great... Uh, you know, men and women, you sent them around, all around, all over the known world at the time to spread uh, Christianity so that we too could become a part of it. And we thank you for that. And 
we just thank you for it all. We thank you that you're coming again. And in Jesus' name, amen.